Welcome to Cinemaholics, a special bonus review where, you know, we did review Justice League in 2017, not quite four years ago, like three and a half years ago. And here we go. This is our four hour conversation. It's the full version of Justice League because the fans were asking for it. The fans were sending us emails, release the Holics cut, where they were telling us, you know what? We definitely don't feel like you reviewed Justice League enough right so here it is and obviously this is not gonna be a four-hour conversation i'll actually be shocked if it is but no we're, we're just doing a review of Zack snyder's justice league i'm john degroni host of the main show and with me of course i have will ashton hello and special guest he is a writer of course for cinemaholics you've read you've probably read everything he's ever written in his, in his entire life everywhere he's gone to donis gonzalez hey guys how's it going Adonis, this is great because we didn't get to talk to you about Justice League in 2017. So I actually don't know the details of your position on that movie, either the, the first time you saw it or years later, like where you stand on it. That's right. Yeah, I, I realized when we were talking about it a couple of days ago that we actually only talked about Batman v Superman when that came out. Yeah. Yeah. So for people who don't know, Adonis and I used to co-host a podcast called Now Conspiring. So Batman v Superman came out in 2016, the heyday of Now Conspiring. I mean, that was when it was just hitting on all cylinders, probably. And so we talked about Batman v Superman so much that <laughs> summer, I, if I recall. Yeah, we we definitely ran up the tree with it. Um, it was it was interesting because we actually we didn't see it together and we didn't share our thoughts until we got to recording and. It was shocking how similar our experiences with this movie were uh, and how frustrating it was, really. Uh, not with this movie, with uh, BVS. Yeah, I was going to say, which movie are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, got to clarify. Yeah, yeah. So then, yeah, a year goes by and Justice League comes out. Will and I reviewed it, of course, for Cinemaholics. It was a ton of fun. Everybody had a good time, I hope. And I actually was listening to that conversation not too long ago. And I was, first of all, shocked by like, wow, Cinemaholics has changed so much in the past <laughs> few years. But also, I was kind of like really shocked, like where we all stood on it. And so we might might have to bring some of that up later. But let, let's let's set this movie up a little bit and talk about this new version of Justice League. So Justice League, it comes out in late 2017 with Joss Whedon and Chris Terrio as the screenwriters and directors picking it up in the middle of post-production from Zack Snyder. Now, Zack Snyder, of course, had been working on the DC Extended Universe of Films since Man of Steel in 2013. And at that point, we had gotten just Man of Steel and Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, both from Zack Snyder, but then we also got Wonder Woman from Patty Jenkins. But in that time, in that like kind of... Oh, and Suicide Squad, of course. But in that time... We did we did have Justice League in development, and it, it felt like in the aftermath of Batman v Superman, Warner Brothers was looking at their slate of films. They were looking at how they, they really wanted to have a shared cinematic universe similar to Marvel. But you know, they, didn't, they didn't want to do it the same way as Marvel. They wanted it to be more serious. They wanted it to replicate the success, the commercial and critical success of their Christopher Nolan films, right? Your Batman Begins... Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises. Those films did really well, but they they were successful without all the jokes, the quips, and all of that. So they're looking at Zack Snyder as this guy who actually is interested in picking up an entire cinematic universe for them, being their version of Kevin Feige. And so they bring him in, and, and he's kind of the creative oversight of this whole universe. And in the context of Justice League being in post-production, a very reactionary film even then, because... They were looking at the critical backlash, the audience backlash on Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, which did make a bunch of money and was liked by some people, and including Will Ashton, which we might get into. I think people were looking at, uh, people of Warner Brothers, I should say, they, they were looking at how do we make Justice League, how do we make our own cinematic universe that kind of strikes a good balance between like the jokes, family, comedy, action formula of Marvel, but with the stuff that we do really well the sort of operatic style, the more sort of like larger than life cinematic bombastic quality that Christopher Nolan kind of introduced in 2005, basically perfected in 2008. And 
did okay in 2012. How do, how do we keep that going in a way that's going to make us a ton of money? And so they were going to come out with Justice League. It was going to be a two-parter. It was going to start with like Steppenwolf being the big bad, but then it would be teasing in Darkseid as like a Thanos kind of big villain, very well known in the DC Comics world. But then as Justice League was kind of coming upon arrival, they were looking at what he had made and it was about... I think like four hours long, close to like what this uh, Snyder cut is four hours of just pure movie and kind of into a lot of its deleted scenes. A lot of it is just like extension of what Snyder envisioned for this movie. And they decided they had to make a lot of changes. Now, as this was happening in 2017, Zack Snyder dealt with a very tragic personal family tragedy it's actually referenced in this Zack Snyder's Justice League, the Snyder Cut. And he had to step away from the film. He wasn't fired. He wasn't kicked out. He, you know, none of that. He just, he had to step away from it to be with his family. Uh, very understandable, of course. And as that happened, I, you know, I kind of look at the situation as Warner Brothers being like, this is our, this is our chance to kind of mess up in a lot of ways, tweak, fiddle with this movie and make it releasable because I don't know about you two. I just do not see this as a film. You could realistically or reasonably release in theaters in its fullest form. It does kind of remind me of how uh, Batman V Superman had an ultimate edition, right? That thing was like three hours or something. I don't remember how long, but it, it was a lot longer and it was like marginally better because there were certain things in it that made a little more sense because they didn't trim it as much. And, the same kind of thing it was happening with Justice League, but to an even bigger extent. They brought in Joss Whedon. They were like, you know what? Avengers time. This is the guy who made the Avengers, Avengers Age of Ultron. We want these movies to make as much money. We want people to watch these movies and be like, man, Justice League is amazing. Buy a bunch of toys. And the problem is Justice League comes out, the 2017 version, and it's two hours long. And people just kind of shrugged their shoulders at it. I was re-listening to our conversation about it three and a half years ago, Will, and that that was definitely the impression. In fact, you know what, Will Ashton, I uh, I have a little a little snippet from that conversation. I knew this was what the surprise was going to be, <laughs> but okay, go ahead. <laughs> you know me too well, Will. So so this is this is uh, what Will had to say about Justice League in November 2017. Those extra characters there. So starting with you, uh, Will Ashton, okay. what did you think of Justice League? Uh, I'm just going to cut to the chase. I find this movie really frustrating um, just because I am somebody who was giving the DCEU the benefit of the doubt. I am someone who, you know, for the most part, championed them. I mean, I understand that they were in a rough spot. They keep getting like compared to the MCU. They keep playing second fiddle. But I wanted to see what they were going to do with this. I, I mean, I consider the Justice League, you know, a composite of some of the best superheroes ever. I mean, I just I grew up more on DC comics than I ever did with Marvel. So I have more of an emotional connection to these characters. I'm way more. I mean, just on the principle, I was way more excited about the idea of a Justice League movie than I ever was about the Avengers. Uh, but I just I mean, this is a movie that clearly was just like Suicide Squad taken over by the studio and just turned into just whatever they felt was necessary, which was that, hey, just whatever Marvel was doing right now with the Avengers, just basically do that. So we are basically, so Batman became sort of like, we, we had a somewhat defined character from him, in my opinion, in Batman v Superman, where he was this disgruntled, older Batman who, uh, you know, kind of lurks in the shadows. He's not really up for fighting crime, but he kind of feels the need to. And this movie, he's just basically the Iron Man stand-in. And he's, like, supposed to be dryly funny and, like, kind of the core of the group. But he's, like, so alienating and so, like, unpersonable that it just does not really work, in my opinion. Gal Gadot is fine, but she is not really given the exuberance I felt like she did, had in uh, Wonder Woman. Uh, let's see. Thor is basically Aquaman now. They basically just decided to do that. And then Cyborg is, like... There's potential there. I feel like there's an interesting dilemma with his character, but they try to set it up and they basically just make him our Hulk, which I don't know. I guess that makes sense. He needed just... his own movie. Yeah, that's he what really I mean. He, him, I really don't think it was a good idea to introduce these characters at all in this film. I think they really need to have those standalone films because that really just muddles the water. So you you go on there for a while, Will, and it's it's obviously great. It's you know 
it's Will Ashton and like and subscribe. And his, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but yeah, you talk about a bunch of stuff there. For, you 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 mentioned that you did actually like Ezra Miller in this, but you yeah. do met you do say that the jokes you didn't like the jokes. Yeah, that they didn't work for you. So listening back to Will the old Will, you know, first of all, young, the young you young. sound so young. Yeah, you've yeah. grown up. You've yeah, grown all up. the cigar and brandies have really affected my voice <laughs> over the past three or four yeah. years. Uh, but your your impeccable review style has not has not missed a beat. But yeah, what, what do you what do you think of uh, your old self versus like you have a couple years on this now? You have a little bit more hindsight. Where do you, where where are you? Where do you, how do you feel about this right now? I just want to poke inside your brain a bit. Yeah, I mean, I'm not too different from where I was then. I did rewatch some of the uh, theatrical cut of the film before we did this episode, just out of curiosity, because I had seen the Snyder cut. I was just like, yeah, you know, let's go back. Let's kind of see what that was, you know, because I remember, like I said in that review, I remember feeling really frustrated when I saw the film. But then as some time passed, I was kind of, you know, I, I kind of let it go. I was just like, you know, it, it was what it was. I, I there are other movies with it. Like, yeah, I mean, that was a weird thing about the Snyder cut movement for me was that like, after like a few months, I kind of just let it go. Just like, you know, it, it happened. I'm not happy what they did with the movie, but, you know, life goes on. And, you know, it, it was just a, it was a bad experience at the movies, but there are other movies and I made peace with it. But clearly a lot of other people held that resentment for a lot longer than I did. So here we are. But um, yeah, I mean, I think what I said there mostly stands. I mean, I, I, I think it was just apparent that they really condensed the film to be almost incoherent compared to like what we got with this version and it just felt like they were meddling a lot with the ver- the, the film to the point where it just was wasn't what it was before it was just Warner Brothers interpretation of what they felt this movie should be and it was very reactionary it was very uh you know it, it was it was trying to be so many things at once that it wasn't really much of anything it was like a saltine cracker of a movie and you know that's that's the reason why a lot of people got upset <laughs> So uh, that explains why I couldn't whistle after I watched it. Sure. So I guess I, I mean, compared to what I was listening to, or compared to what I was saying then or what we were listening to, I, I feel I'm pretty much at the same place as I was. Well, we're now at this point where it looks like we d- we have gotten the full vision and we did a whole episode about how this came to be a year ago with Dan Merle, formerly of Screen Junkies. That was a lot of fun. He came on the show. We talked about the behind the scenes of this and what what it actually means that Warner Brothers actually greenlit this. First observation is what an expensive movie considering like if you take the budgeting of the first movie, the reshoots that they had to do, and then all the extra money they had to put into this Snyder cut, this is one of the, this could be one of the most expensive movies ever made. Just, just looking at like the sheer volume of the film and how what they all the wasted money of trying to make this thing fit into something multiple times. It's like three different major drafts, if you will. And I think the end result is actually, as as we'll get into it, certainly fitting to Snyder as a filmmaker. It's like this to me feels like it could be the chapter closer of the DCEU as we used to know it in a way that's actually kind of nice. But before we talk about what we think of the movie itself, and I I definitely have a lot to say on that, this is coming to HBO Max. It is a streaming-only movie. It is about four hours long, 242 minutes. It's split up almost like a miniseries, but it's presented as one feature film, sort of. Uh, There's no intermission, though. There's part one to part six. There's an epilogue. It's it's kind of just a lot. It's it's the kind of thing that where I think you could watch it in multiple sittings. I saw it in one sitting, basically. I think I actually know two sittings because I stopped to eat some food so that I wouldn't starve uh, because that is how long this movie is, but other otherwise. Uh, but okay, so Adonis Gonzalez, I genuinely don't know what your like status quo is with DC movies in general. I mean, we've talked about a lot of movies together, you and I, but we haven't talked about any of the recent ones. I don't know what you think of Wonder Woman 1984, Shazam, Aquaman, Birds really of Prey, Joker. Those, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've asked you, but you're always just like, just wait, John, just wait. It, it was <laughs> like you were, you were like, this is this, you, this is why you got to get me on for the Snyder Cut because that's when you're gonna find out. I I had it, to it's, earn it. it. It's all coming to a head, right? I yeah. I, I wanted to tell you, but it was there was a lot of interference from third parties, and I feel like now, uh, with the cultural landscape that we're in, 
uh, kind of shifting a little differently. I think it is yeah. time for me to let you know how I feel about all of those DC movies that came out. Um, no, but personally, I I can't say that I wanted to hate the DCEU, and I, I don't hate the DCEU, but I can't say that I wanted to dislike it the way that I did for a while after Batman vs. Superman. I think I was with Will uh, at the beginning. I really wanted to give it the benefit of the doubt uh, because I, I really like comic books. I am more of a Marvel fan, admittedly, but I do like Justice League and Batman. There are a lot of really cool stories uh, in the comics that I was excited to to see on the big screen uh, and with all these different rumors about like where the Justice League was going, what they were going to do with Green Lantern. It was it was exciting. It was kind of like how I felt at the beginning of the MCU all over again, right? Like there's this entirely new world, uh, this new cinematic world that can be explored. And then Batman vs Superman came out and it was kind of a letdown, you know? And I can't remember how much longer after that Suicide Squad came out, but that one was kind of just like... Yeah, like it was putting just a salt. few months later. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't too long after that. Because um, they were the same year, right? They were both 2016. Yeah, yeah, Batman v Superman. It was like their spring release, I want to say. It was mm-hmm. in like maybe May, or maybe April. And then Suicide Squad was like early August, I want to say. Like tail end of the summer. Right. And that one was... It wasn't as bad as Batman vs Superman to me, and I still rewatching. I, I I tried to watch uh, those and the theatrical version of Justice League recently uh, before watching the Snyder Cut. And looking back, I still kind of feel the same about each of them. Um, but honestly, my outlook on the DC movies is a little brighter, having seen movies like Birds of Prey and uh, even Joker and um, Shazam. Uh, not necessarily because of the quality of the movies. I think there are. I think they are better films. Uh, I just like that DC seems to be uh, l- loosening the reins a little bit. You know, especially with movies like Joker and Shazam, where they don't necessarily have to connect to the larger DCEU. Shazam is kind of just like it, it's a part of it. Um, and that man yeah, like still tangentially though. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's winking and nodding at it. Right. Exactly. And so I do like that they're opening. They're opening up a little bit more, letting directors and letting uh, creators, you know, keep their vision. But it still is very hit or miss, and most of it is miss, honestly. I honestly was not a fan of Wonder Woman 1984. I thought it was okay. Um, I think it could have been much better. I think they kind of played it safe for most of the movie, and they... thought they played it safe? I, I think so. I think they went with a very basic plot line with that. It felt very... Spider-Man 3-ish to me. They took such a massive swing with that plot, I thought. You think About so? About Wishes? I mean, how bonkers was that movie, though? It, I mean, I don't know. I, this is not a Wonder Woman 1984 conversation, but that is that is one thing about that movie that, like, I don't think it really works overall. I like the movie, personally, but I think that it there's a reason people responded pretty negatively to it, and I think it's because its premise was just so odd, and I kind of love it for that, to be totally honest with you. It was odd, and it, it is a very outrageous movie. I can see why it has uh, a following of people who do enjoy it, but I can also see why a lot of people uh, didn't like it. I kind of fall into that latter category. I, I don't know. It just felt, and, and I don't want to talk too much about that either, because I know this isn't the movie we're focusing on, but it just yeah. felt very, uh, uh, it, it, it felt very like by the numbers, you know, like she gets yeah. a friend who, you know, is going to betray her at the end. Uh, there's uh, a white guy in government who very clearly has ulterior motives and is, uh, is using people to, uh, to achieve his own goals. Uh, I, I don't know. It just felt very, straightforward for me uh despite its outrageous premise um but yeah i i do have hope for the dceu and i do want to see more out of it i really am excited for like james gunn's suicide squad i think that's going to be really interesting if they let him just yeah do what he does as as a director uh and i did really enjoy birds of prey that movie i saw twice in theaters actually i i really did enjoy that one i think that that was much better than the suicide squad or, or much better than suicide squad that was the last superhero movie I saw in theaters. I think it was the last superhero movie in theaters, wasn't it? Uh, I don't know. 
Uh, because I guess uh, there was Bloodshot. Some people consider that a superhero oh, true, thing. True. Actually, you know what? Adonis Gonzalez, I lied to you. The last superhero movie I saw in theaters was the last movie I saw in theaters, which was My Hero Academia Heroes Rising. That is a superhero movie. Oh, I missed but that in one. Terms of in terms of live action, then yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's I a good one I wanted to check well. that one out. Yeah. Yeah, DCEU is so weird. It's like every single movie, they're so different from each other they're all over the place and they all kind of tell like a different part of this ongoing story of like Warner brothers really just not knowing what to do with these Marvel movies. It's kind of sad in a lot of ways because they, you know that they had all this talent, they had all this goodwill with the public and in some ways it feels a little squandered, but it depends on who you ask. Some people are going to tell you that, no, these movies are amazing. Like I remember when Will Ashton wrote his review of Suicide Squad, which I know, Will, you you liked Batman v Superman more than Suicide Squad. And you wrote a negative review of Suicide Squad. And I remember yeah. people people were trying to like tell you you were you were out of out of your league or something, out of your Justice League. I, I'll never forget that. Yeah, I mean, that was uh, I wrote that for Heroic Hollywood. So admittedly, the audience was... Uh... I yeah, guess they they had they had conceptions in mind of what the film should be and how people should feel about it, and I didn't really fit into those uh, opinions. I was actually kind of kind on the film. I remember, and people were still I thought pre- so. Yeah, for people, I, and I should say I was I'm kind of biased on I, the reason I know so much about the reaction is because I was the DC editor of Heroic Hollywood at the time, and in fact, I think around that time, Adonis, you were writing for Heroic Hollywood. Look at that, a little bit of yeah. a reunion here. <laughs> but yeah. So, you know, it, it's been it's been a long and, and winding road for DC, the DCEU. I think that, you know, the future looks fine, I guess, because I wasn't the biggest fan of Aquaman. I just wasn't. But Shazam, I'm just going to say, I think Shazam's the best one of these. I've been thinking about it. And if you're just if you're just judging these movies by what all the way through is at least good and feels like it just really works. It it doesn't need other movies. It doesn't need anything. It's just it's just a good movie by itself. That to me is Shazam. I know a lot of people might not agree, but yeah, well, tell me tell me why you think I should just uh, stop talking. I I don't dislike Shazam. I think it's pretty good overall, but that's just the one that I always forget about. Like I'm always just like, "Oh yeah, Shazam. That's also in the DC EU." Like I just don't yeah, remember it. I, I don't know what for it. I just, I just, it has my heart. I guess. I mean, like, I don't think Aquaman is a better movie than Shazam, but I have more affection for Aquaman because it's just so absurd. Huh, interesting. And I think it's just, like, so bombastic in a way that reminds me of uh, those 90 movies from, like, the superhero movies from the 90s. And clearly that's what Shazam is going for. But like you said, I feel like it's such a, like, you know, kind of by the books, like, your typical kind of uh, superhero movie by way of big that I didn't, I just didn't leave that much of an impression on me. But I did have a good time watching it. I thought it was a fine film. It's the it's the foster family angle. I think that sure. just gets me. That's I just fair. watched that movie and I'm like and and the wish fulfillment of it with the big storyline. It's I don't know, I think that's why it clicks for me. Adonis, I, I I I think you probably have never told me what you think of Shazam. Uh I haven't. Uh I actually agree with that you, John. That's purpose? actually my favorite. Uh I, I wanted to keep it from you for no oh, particular yeah. reason. So that's your favorite as well? It High is five? I I really like it because it kind of goes for what I think Warner Brothers was trying to go for with Justice League. Uh, as as past Will mentioned, they were kind of trying to go for like a, oh, here's what Marvel's doing. We should do that too kind of thing. <laughs> I like right? how past Will is like another co-host. <laughs> <laughs> I have some more clips. We <laughs> <laughs> well, hey. Um, but no, I, I think that uh, it has a lot of charm. It has a lot of heart. And... You know, a lot of people, I feel like a lot of people who don't like it or uh, think negatively about it, like the, a lot of the intense DC fans go, oh, you only like it because it's doing what Marvel's doing. And I don't necessarily think that's the case. It is funny, like a lot of, it has that, that kind of humor that you do see in a Marvel movie, but I just think it's because Shazam is that kind of character. Like in the comics, he is an uplifting charming sort of captain america type of character in the sense that you see him and like he's supposed to or i, I guess superman kind of character uh for a better yeah, i mean unless you were going for captain marvel his uh original name oh you know and i always forget that that's what they called him before uh. they had to change it 
The newer comics, by the way, for him are actually really interesting, and they, they drew a lot from that movie. But you know, before okay, before we get all sidetracked, I feel we're like half an hour almost into this, and we haven't even talked Jeez, about. We're on part three already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That that was the plan. That was the plan. So long story made even longer. Zack Snyder's Justice League is here. It's a four-hour movie. It is a movie with much of the same cast returning. And one thing I didn't mention about the Joss Whedon version is that I, I kind of mentioned it actually. They did a lot of reshoots, and you can kind of tell just because if you if you look at screenshots or like clips side by side, you can see that they literally reshot scenes from Zack Snyder's assembly cut in order just to put in more jokes. And that's kind of what I was getting at with like how expensive was this movie because they they must have spent millions of dollars just to punch this thing up. And I'm kind of annoyed because like watching the four hour version, it is kind of sad that they didn't just commit <laughs> to like to to what Snyder had kind of put together here. Because here here's my thing: as much as I hate Batman versus Superman, and Dawn of Justice, I look at Justice League, this full version of it, and I'm like, think it actually does resolve a lot of the problems I had. And I think I think the reaction to that movie. P the, the interpretation of that reaction was make it just like Marvel, make it super funny. Don't do any of the grim, dark stuff where I think it's just a balance of those things. I think that it's just, it was just too much in BVS. It was like 90% in the wrong direction. And then this version just pulls it back a bit. It's still over the top. It's still overly operatic and style over substance in a lot of ways, but at least it's, it feels of a piece. It, it feels like a completed finished product. So I'm just going to be the first one to say it. I think this, and this is not a controversial opinion. I think this thing is vastly superior to the Whedon version. And I would say for a lot of people, it's going to be a very satisfying watch, whether they binge it or watch it in multiple sittings. I think that way more people are going to get something out of this, be satisfied by the film, come out of it feeling like it was an experience, you know, like an actual cinematic experience and of course some people are going to watch it and be like whatever i you know they're not going to like this one either <laughs> because they didn't like the the whedon version and it, in a lot of ways it is basically the same story the same movie just a little bit better but if you had fundamental problems with the original i, I don't know if that's going to change much for you with this one but will you know i'm not going to ask past will about this he doesn't know anything about Zack snyder's justice league so what, what about you though because uh, you're fresh off this one i i have i'm anxious to hear what you have to say uh yeah similar to you i i do think this is a quite improvement over the theatrical version which admittedly wasn't a high bar but i do think uh there is quite a bit more to this movie that for one it's coherent like you can understand the plot you can understand character motivations like the characters actually feel fairly fleshed out in a way that they weren't in the theatrical version for instance we do actually get to see uh, the Flash and Cyborg developed as characters. We do understand a little bit more of their backstory. We get to spend a little bit more time with them, understand their motivations, understand who they are as people and as superheroes. And, you know, it's 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 a small thing, but it's also a very big thing. Like, it, it does drag out the first half of this movie, but it does give us a better understanding of the core dynamic of the group. And then when they do actually get together, there is something fairly triumphant about that, as opposed to the theatrical version, which is like kind of like, oh, well, we gotta do this now because it's the third act, yeah. and we gotta we gotta be a team now. And this one, it's actually you know, it does feel like a like raw, like it, it feels like a triumphant big moment, and it feels earned in a way that a lot of the moments in the theatrical version don't feel earned. And I guess that's I guess the key to this thing is that even though it is such a long, fairly indulgent film, I think even uh, Zack Snyder would admit that this is a fairly indulgent effort. It does. He'd brag about it. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, hell yeah, it's indulgent. You know what I had yeah. to do to get this thing out there? Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's going to annoy people. I can understand that. I am ultimately a fan of Zack Snyder. I think... You know, there's a lot to criticize about him. I, I don't think he's the smartest filmmaker. I don't think he often lives up to his potential. I think the ideas that he comes up with, they're often better than what he's able to do. But I do think he is a fairly idiosyncratic filmmaker. I think he has a distinct style. I think he has a distinct vision for his properties. And I think he really goes for him 100% in a way that does feel fairly sincere. Like, I don't think there's any irony in his movies or anything like that. I don't always agree with his creative choices or what he does with these characters. But I do think he does fully commit to his bit in a way that, uh, with this film, you know, being a four-hour victory lap, basically, it, it does feel like a exuberant, 
kind of like against the odds movie that, you know, it's just very surreal to see it because you just, you know, didn't really expect this to actually come out, let alone to see it in such a long, uh, you know, extended version. And uh, by and large, I just think it's a winner. Yeah, it just it, it doesn't uh, resolve all the flaws, I think, of the theatrical version. I think a lot of stuff that I didn't like in the theatrical version is still in this film. But at the same time, you know, I think what works here often uh, stands out and makes up for those flaws. And it, it just proves to be a weirdly kind of emotional moving experience. And I definitely got a lot more out of this one than I ever got out of the uh, condensed theatrical version. I, I was watching this and I was like, this, I, I honestly would have been shocked if this hadn't had been better a better experience for you, Will, because we've talked about BVS so many times, and that's what you've always said about that movie is that you appreciate it, you respect it, you you look at it as something that doesn't mimic the sort of assembly line Marvel movie sort of formula. Now, I, I'm a, I'm kinder to the Marvel movies, I think overall, because I do think that even though they do have some of that sameness in between a segment of those movies, I think some of the other ones do kind of go to some exciting and different places and that I, I enjoy the diversity of the MCU. I just think that it, it's a very reliable franchise, even though it doesn't, it doesn't reach the highest of the highs in terms of film that goes, it just never really quite has with maybe a couple of exceptions. And with, with Zack Snyder, let's look at this guy. He come, he, he is to me, the, you like him or you you love him or you don't there aren't there just aren't a lot of people who like him but like it sounds like will you like him you don't love his work overall but i think you're you're a rare breed because it seems like the reaction to his stuff is always pretty extreme like i people either really really love his movies or they reject him completely and they think he's a terrible filmmaker and it's funny because from what i can tell he seems like a very nice guy he seems like somebody who works really well with people. People like collaborating with him. He seems like a charming guy because he's able to, I mean, this is a guy who's able to fail up in some ways, if you have to be totally honest. Well, I think that, I think this is my guess or my interpretation. I think because of the movies that he made, people kind of create an image of Zack Snyder in their heads and they kind of assume that their head canon of Zack yeah. Snyder was like the real Zack Snyder. They think he's some edge lord when he's not. Basically, yeah, he's like some kind of like like overly masculine edge lord dude bro kind of guy, like a Michael Bay. Sure, basically, yeah, he's yeah. very Michael Bayish. But ultimately, I mean, especially from the like press tour that we've gotten from the Snyder cut, people are realizing like, oh, he's actually like a very sincere, sweet, unironic guy who just yeah. has a infatuation with big, loud expensive kind of dumb movies Most and he like. does them in a way that is very collaborative and sweet and people are like oh well you know that's not what i had in mind that's not the person that they i created in my head so now i'm actually kind of willing to give him benefit of the doubt at least some people some people are still you know like i don't like this guy i don't like his movies whatever mm -hmm. that's fine but i that's my interpretation at least you can disagree but that's that's how i feel about it i fully agree i maintain that Zack snyder one of the reasons that he has had as successful a career as he has had, despite his movies usually not doing super well critically. They tend to do pretty good box office wise, but critically, he he's never been a a darling of film critics, and e even audience reactions can kind of vary with him. You have something like Dawn of the Dead, definitely worked re worked out super well for him. Three Hundred was a big pop cultural moment. Watchmen was was where things just get kind of strange because I think very weird reaction to that movie all across the board where it felt like the only people calling this the movie a masterpiece were 19 year olds like me and otherwise like people were like what the heck is this he he makes Legends of the Guardians the Owls of Gahul fantastic movie that basically nobody saw didn't really make an impact Sucker Punch and is just one of the worst films of 2011 widely rejected i i remember at the time some people were defending it but as time has gone on i don't i don't know anybody who sticks up for sucker punch and why would they and yet despite all that despite watchmen like that one two three punch of all three of those movies just failing to really fully land he gets the keys to dc films he gets man of steel he gets to be a co-screenwriter on the 300 sequel, which that makes sense, of course. He gets this big, sprawling Batman versus Superman movie. In the aftermath of that, he gets Justice League, even though that's it, it completely... So that's what I mean by, like, fails up. And 
I, I kind of look at the situation as it works out for the guy, but it does make me a little angry. Like how many people's careers would have shut down completely after just Watchmen, let alone, you know, the, the, owl, the, the good owls movie and the atrocious sucker punch movie. And it, it's nothing critically I'm saying of him. Of course, I think that it, he's a hard worker and I, I am glad he's had the success he's had, but I'd, I would also bring up by the way, I think that his best movies, in my opinion, are the ones where he has the, like the least creative control where he's not the screenwriter. He's a director. Uh, for, for that reason, I look at like Leah yeah, legend of the guardians and, and Watchmen. I think those, I, I, I maintain Watchmen is a good film, uh, but those are films that he didn't really do much with the script. I, I know he didn't technically, he doesn't get screenwriting credit for BVS, but I think we can probably surmise that he had a lot to do with everything with that film. Do you agree? I mean, are you really a big fan of Legend of the Guardians, or is that like, is this? Yeah, that's good? not a bit. I saw okay. that in theaters, and that movie. <laughs> I saw that it movie in theaters owns. too. I just I don't remember it that well. I, I I've seen it. I remember going to the theaters to see it in 3D at a press screening, but I just don't remember having much of a reaction to it. I, I thought it looked very pretty, but you're Back a big me fan up, of that. Adonis. Okay, I I've never seen Legend of the Guardians. For a Dang minute, it. I thought we were talking about Rise of the Guardians, and I was ready to back oh, you wow, up. Oh yeah. wow! Oh, no, Rise of the Guardians <laughs> is good. No, that's a good film. Yeah, that one's really it's good. Great. That's Yeah, yeah, that's a good film. It's a great trilogy, an, an unofficial trilogy: Legend of the Guardians, <laughs> Rise of the Guardians. Yeah, yeah, but no, I Legend of the Guardians, Alza Kahul. I haven't revisited it in eleven years, but I bet if I did, I would like it even more. And no, I don't know. I don't know. I mean. <laughs> It's not that I dislike it or have strong feelings, but I just don't remember having any reaction to it other than like, oh, that looked pretty. Like that was, <laughs> that's that's like my like strongest reaction to the film. Granted, I saw that like you said like a decade ago, so I don't know if my critical analysis was that strong, but yeah, it stuck with me. I what can I tell you? But anyway, so Zack Snyder's Justice League. <laughs> this feels like the culmination of a career that has been really up and down, right? Adonis, when you were watching this. What, what were what were you experiencing? And, and, and were, did you watch it in one sitting? I forgot to ask you. I did, yeah. I actually watched it with a couple of friends of mine who were uh, thankfully excited to watch it with me. Well, I don't want to say excited, but it's it's hard to get people to want to sit down and <laughs> I watch paid a them. forum. <laughs> I don't want to say excited. They were excited they got paid by me. <laughs> they got free food. Yeah, when the, when, the, when the Venmo transfer came through, they were really excited. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But no, I, I did watch it in, in one full sitting. I did pause for like a brief second just to like get up and stretch. But it was literally just a, where are we at in this movie? Oh, there's two hours left. Okay, all right. Let me just reconnect to reality for a moment here. Yeah. Um, let me call my parents. <laughs> so yeah, right. let, me. <laughs> let them know that I'm okay. I haven't tweeted no, no, in a I'm while. No, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, I wanted to say, though, it's, it's funny that you mentioned... Uh, like your your thoughts on Zack Snyder, like as a person, as a director, because uh, this movie, if anything, it definitely this movie and the the road that uh, it took to to get made, like the road to it being made, uh, definitely made me appreciate him a little bit more. Uh, I don't I don't want to say I ever like genuinely hated his movies, but there hasn't really been one, at least that I can think of, where I can say I loved it. You know. Um, I've liked, like, I liked 300, uh, I liked Watchmen, but there's always something about his particular directing style that kind of just rubs me a different way, you know, like, whether it's the, the overuse of slow motion or the, the, in the overindulgence, the, the, um, the huge allegoric references to, like, the Bible and, and, and Jesus and man versus monster and, and all these themes that he t he he tends to tackle a lot. I think that he he has a good grasp on what he wants to do as a filmmaker. You know, this that seems to be a story he wants to tell a lot. But it's just something that never really captured me. And that was a bit of a fundamental issue I had with with but Batman v Superman and Justice League, where I'm looking at this guy and I'm going, oh my god, he really. And when I say Justice League, I mean the the 2017 version. Uh, and, and and this one a little bit too, because there there are scenes in this movie and in those movies where it's just like, okay, I get it. He really really wants to drive the point home that this is what this scene is referencing. Like Superman is a god, and and I I get it, I do. Um, and that isn't to say anything about him as a person, because I also think that he's probably a very nice guy. It seems that everyone who, even even those who worked on the Snyder cut, who had to get the call, like, hey. 
you're going to be working on this movie that you probably didn't want to think about since it's theatrical release, but you're going to be coming back for recuts. Uh, they all seem to be like really excited and enthusiastic to be working with Zach yeah. and to to help him see his version of the film come out. I mean, so. didn't didn't like Ben Affleck and Gal Gadot and a few other people yeah. that were like the main stars? They were like the ones that allowed it to be right because they were the ones that were getting behind. Right, the, right. Like, Jason Momoa, so it wasn't even like they yeah. were. So it wasn't even just like they got called back. It was like they were actively trying to get this movie to be made or True. Th- to be redone. So And you yeah. can see why. I mean, after you watch this movie, you're like, of course, like they want the best version of this movie to be out there. They want right. the, all the work that they put into it to really come to fruition in a way that makes people happy. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. I, and I truly think that this is the best version of the movie to come to come out despite it despite how long it is and despite some of the issues that i still have with it that we'll we'll get into later but i i think that it was a good choice and a good decision on all of their parts to to campaign for this movie because i i remember when the snyder cut that that hashtag snyder cut trend first came out i thought it was a joke i was like guys there is no four hour long version or whatever hour long version of this movie that zach is holding on to like it's just the movie's out that's how it is and you know, time passed and there was more and more evidence that there was. And then he finally came out and said, yeah, I do have a version of the movie. And uh, I am really glad that despite all the naysaying uh, and despite the, the toxicity coming from both sides, because there were a lot of Snyder fans, uh, there were a lot of people for and a lot of people against the movie that that took the Internet discourse just a little bit too far uh, ever since BVS came yeah. out, but I, there were, I there were people on both sides of it who were obnoxious. Like we can oh, yeah. definitely say that. Yeah. Like there were people who were like, it's impossible. It's like, no, it's not impossible. I mean, it, right. it wasn't like that. Yeah. And then there were a lot of people who, who liked, who loved the movie, uh, well, who loved Batman vs Superman and kind of just went a little bit too far with the, the Snyder appreciation, I think too. Yeah. They're harassing people. They're going after people, doxing and treating it like yeah, it, it, we're going way too far for something that it was unnecessary. Right. Right. Yeah. To the point where like, I feel like if anyone like harassed or like abused or doxed anybody for this movie, like they should have the satisfaction of knowing that this movie exists, but they shouldn't get to see it. Like that should be like the, like the takeaway is that like, if you like mistreat anyone for this to exist, like you have you can know it exists, but you can't see it. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, like, I, I mean, to be right. clear, you don't. We don't think you deserve to see it. I mean, we know you're going to see it anyway, and no one's going to stop right. you. But like, well, so I, mean, yeah. I just mean that, like, <laughs> it's just that, like, I don't think that, like, anyone should be like mistreated for a film, and just like the fact that, like, they they kind of won because of this, and they feel like emboldened by it, feels kind of gross. But at the same time, like, ultimately, it's a success story for Snyder, and that's, I think what should be championed here is that the fact that this guy like went through this terrible ordeal and he got this movie back and that's like the, obviously the triumph of it. But at yeah. the same time, there is like this, this undercurrent, this like kind of like, like you said, toxic undercurrent where it's just like, Oh, these people who are really mean to people online also won in a sense. So, and there were, there were film critics too, who were just acting like this ever happening would be the end of the world or it would represent something awful when no i mean i I don't know i just think that there were some critics who were really condescending to Mm -hmm. the to fans who weren't toxic who didn't do anything wrong and being like yeah you're stupid if you think this thing could ever happen which to be fair it was always pretty unlikely the only reason this happened at all was because of the pandemic and because warner brothers has this streaming service that it actually really works out that they could invest money into something like this and release it in a way that helps them financially. If, if not for those factors, this never would have happened. I don't think unless some other crazy factors would have come into play. Right. I, I think that this is a huge win, not only for uh, Zack Snyder, but I think it's a win for streaming services and their capabilities. And also just like filmmaking in general, I think that this is a really cool way to, and I, I don't know if we're going to ever get something like this again, but if we were, I think this is a really cool way to sort of let filmmakers tell stories with these characters that don't necessarily have to adhere to what the studio is going for canonically wise, right? Like I can see Marvel spinning this as a as a sort of Tales from the Multiverse thing that, that'll appear on Disney Plus where you can kind of see different versions. I mean, they're already doing that What If animated series. I... I can already see this becoming something where it's like, well, if you want a different version of these stories we're telling, now you have a way to do it. And also, like, if you want a longer version 
of these stories. Like I know Endgame was pushing it, and and this one is like really really pushing it. But now there's a way to see these like four like three four hour long superhero epics uh, for people who genuinely want to see them. Yeah, you know, as we kind of jump a little bit more into the nuts and bolts of this thing, because because we've been we've been out laying out a ton of context, which is great. Because it, it's hard to even approach this without being upfront about where it comes from, what it means, and all of that. But as we kind of lean into some, maybe some more specific thoughts on this, there's something you said, Adonis, that definitely it definitely got me thinking a little bit of what I think of Snyder's approach to film. And you kind of mentioned that there there's certain things he does in his movies that rub you the wrong way. And I've thought about this a lot. I've tried to reckon with what it is about his filmmaking style and approach to movies that just doesn't quite click with me overall, like for most of his movies. And I think in all of his movies, there is a very big, there's a distance, a human distance between the characters and the audience that I struggle with a little bit. And I think he he has a, an approach to cinematic language that is very cynical. It is very, like he deals with the anti-mythology of our time where he wants to take these superheroes, he wants to take characters and make them like really hype up how they're outsiders to society. They're better than society and they ha- they can they should look down on peons. He he hates it seems like the plight of the everyday person in these movies. You'll notice in the in the Snyder cut in the longer version there there's no real attention to the people who like people on the ground level, right? Like the people who who would suffer from the consequences of dark side taking over and all that it, it, it's just never really touched on and he's kind of dabbled in it a little bit probably because of the studio and because the screenwriters coming in with things like bvs where we kind of open with why does batman have it out for superman and it's a little bit more of like reframing how man of steel kind of plays out in the third act of the devastation that it brought and there was a lot of the criticism in that movie that i shared i I do not like man of steel very much but yeah my biggest issue with that movie was that distance of like it just feels like superman is just so far above everybody else and i don't know it's just he's having this head-to-head battle with this person and tons of people are dying and the film just doesn't seem to really care about those people and in this movie in the whedon movie i should say whedon does try to put some of that in there they did all these reshoots they put in this like family that like lives on the outskirts of the third act and there you we check in with them every once in a while it's like this is why we're here is what the movie's saying to us it's like you got to care about this family if they don't make it out then the whole world is doomed and that's kind of how it's positioned and the problem is people saw through that right i saw through that and you're watching the movies like this isn't snyder like i know you're trying to dress up snyder's kind of shortcomings for some of his audience like me who don't respond well to that sort of thing but it 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 has to commit like it has to have a lane you can't really fuse those things together because then like will said it's not coherent and what we mean by that is you can't have a movie that's stylistically one way and then just insert other things to try to insist it's something else because if those things too i think well another thing you said and it's it's a classic will ashton line in uh, the old review you said you said it's like mixing uh, chocolate with paint thinner <laughs> And uh, I think that that works really well. And in this, it, to me, it's just full-on paint thinner. And uh, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I think this, this, this movie is actually pretty good. But yeah, Will, Will what do you think? Because I know you respond a little bit better to his sort of like approach to people and gods and all of that. Do you see that sure. portrayed better here? And if so, like, you know, let's get into a little bit of detail. What, what were some things you would want to pick out? Yeah, I mean, I I do disagree with you not only on Batman v Superman, but Man of Steel. I mean, I haven't seen it since I saw it in theaters, but I do think if it's not his best film, it's probably one of his best. I think it's a genuinely really good uh, deconstruction of the Superman mythos. And obviously the Jesus allegory is done in a very on-the-nose way, but I think it approaches the material in a very, like I said before, sincere and introspective way. And I, I think it works more than it does. And I, I do agree that the climax gets a little too busy and it, it gets a little too excessively violent to the point where it, it does kind of feel like Snyder, Snyder's indulgences kind of got the better of him by the end which is a 
kind of a typical thing that happens in most of his movies. It definitely happened in Batman v Superman, and I would argue it also happens in uh, the Justice League, his Snyder Cut. But um, yeah, I think in terms of his take on the mythos or the like, kind of like Greek god mythology of the DC canon, I think generally by and large, it it, it, it is a little uh, melodramatic. It is, like you said before, operatic in its approach. But by and large, I think the fact that he commits to it and that he's willing to just uh, play up to these dulges in a very sincere way makes it work at least in terms of like watching this film and seeing him fully commit to that and allowing this uh you know very kind of brooding thoughtful film to come together in a way that uh you know it does feel like he is sincere to it he is trying to make this movie feel fully fleshed out he isn't afraid to make it over four hours long and just really relish that idea and ultimately i can see why if you're not with that from the get-go that that's going to be an a very tough hill to climb and i can understand you know especially with the runtime that that's not something you really want to give him the benefit of the doubt but you know by and large i mean i i put up with a lot with superhero movies in general like i, I feel like you kind of just have to let something like you know you just have to like kind of go with a lot of these movies by the core premise of what they are. And I think if you're willing to do that with this film, I I don't think it always works necessarily. I think some of the villain stuff gets super silly, uh, no matter how, you know, serious he tries to paint it up. But, you know, by and large, I I do really appreciate that he's able to do this in a way that uh, feels very much like him and and he doesn't feel unabashed by it or anything. He just, he commits the bit, like I said, and, and he is unafraid to do so. The villain is such an interesting thing because when it comes to that, I can't tell if I'm giving it a lot of credit because of how bad it was before, like if I had watched this, uh, you know, apropos of nothing, if I had just seen this and I didn't, I didn't see the monstrosity and in a bad way, that was Steppenwolf in the original justice league, no characterization, terrible you know, design. design. Yeah. PS2 <laughs> graphics is what I said in that review. Good memory. Will. wow. And, um, you know, he just, he's just a character who just feels so disposable, a villain with no impact, no sort of energy to him. He's just there to fulfill a role, a check, a check on a box. And in this, it's just, it's, it's a lot better, but I can't tell, like if I had seen this without seeing the original, if I would be a little bit more critical, I don't, I don't know. But all I can say is this is just such a vast improvement. He's more imposing, but they, they don't try to make him super imposing. They just make him imposing enough to be like, okay, he's a real obstacle, but his motivations are what make him a little scarier. He will go to any length to do what he needs to do because he has a strong motivating factor that makes him dangerous. It's stuff like that that really sells it. For example, the Amazon sequence where he gets the first mother box, uh, the mother MacGuffin box or whatever, he gets a much longer action scene there where we see the Amazonians of Themyscira in one of the few like narrative payoffs because we've seen in Wonder Woman already that kind of world so we know who they are. And so it's one of the few times that it actually there's some decent setup. And just see him in this elongated action sequence where he just feels like a juggernaut. He's not unstoppable, but he's definitely unstoppable to anybody but Superman. And that's like a persistent theme throughout the movie. So it's, it's like things like that. It's like when you make these scenes a little bit longer and you let them follow their original framework, it works because then you feel like you're watching a movie that it feels like a complete thought. Uh, what, what, what about you, Adonis? I, the villain work for you? And uh, I guess we could, we could talk about like some of the teammates here because uh, the, the people in the actual Justice League. Uh, Steppenwolf definitely worked for me a little more this time around. I still, I think the inclusion of Darkseid as the, as the, um, like the big bad that we know is coming up. Uh, still kind of undermines his purpose in the movie because you know that okay this guy is sort of just a stepping stool until we get to like what they're really like like the like the real threat um but sort of having that in mind and i mean the entire movie kind of does suffer and benefit from hindsight in a way because i also don't know how i would feel about steppenwolf or this movie in general if there already wasn't a version that showed me what it would be what it would be without all of these elements um but even with that in mind i do appreciate that even with steppenwolf he was given more of a reason to be there right like they could have just kept it how they did in the original in in the theatrical 
version where it's just like uh he's a bad guy and he's a minion to this other bad guy and his he whole wants these purpose boxes. Is, yeah he give wants the boxes, the boxes and he'll kill you if you don't give him the boxes and it was very much the same thing in this snyder cut but at the same time you know they gave him sort of his own motive he's like oh i betrayed uh and and this might be getting into a spoiler so I'll, I'll be careful here but he does have his own reason for going to earth and getting these boxes and it's it's touched on a little bit in the movie not a whole lot um but it's just that little bit that makes it a little easier for me to like ingest him as a character and why he's here and it it gives him just enough of uh like an entertainment factor for me to like look past the fact that he still does kind of look a little weird he he looks more polished now uh and look past the fact that like he is just a very basic villain at the end of the day because at the end of the day it's it's a little easier when you give these characters motivation and that's honestly how i felt about the team too like uh he he didn't do a lot with wonder woman or aquaman and i can kind of understand why you know even back then uh wonder woman and aquaman movies were kind of already in the in the plan so you know, right, we they didn't gonna... need as much characterization because Flash and Cyborg, we have to get their origin stories here. Right, right. Whereas we, we, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we already know Wonder Woman because, you know, her movie was coming up uh, shortly after. Or it was it before? Uh, we yeah, didn't we'd Justice already League? gotten the Wonder Woman movie. Right, that's right. Aquaman's yeah. a little different. We wouldn't get the Aquaman movie for a year, but they were kind of saving that, I guess. And that's why he does it. He gets a little bit of stuff, right? He gets like yeah. the meeting Mira and the Willem Dafoe thing. Like there's some of it, but clearly they felt like, okay, he's the next one to get a movie. So we can do Cyborg. We can do Flash. Let that their character arcs kind of fuel this thing. Because if we don't, it'll be too big of a gap between this movie and their solo movies, perhaps. Right, exactly. And I'm really glad that he took uh, excuse me. I'm really glad that he took the time with those characters because I really did not like uh Barry Allen, Ezra Miller as Barry Allen at all in the in the Whedon version. I thought he was way too too cringy. I thought that they were going for the the Tom Holland Peter Parker effect, uh where they have this this super smart character who's just really awkward and trips over his words and it That's was, what our guest said, actually. That's so funny you mentioned that. So Craig Hanks, Legendarium Podcast, he was our guest. He said that exact same thing. He was like, they're just trying to put a Spider-Man into this team, and it doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same thing with how you said a lot of people could see through that ending, uh, it not being very Snyder-like. And I could see through that with with Barry Allen because it was it was obvious that they just wanted this character to be the comedic relief, and they didn't really know what to do with him besides that uh and he didn't really do anything with this one um we don't i mean there's not like a ton of added on stuff but like the scene with uh uh him trying to get a job and seeing iris i thought that was really cool uh he there's he has a much bigger uh part in the ending than he did even even in the original uh even though both films kind of tried to make it a point that like the flash was the was like the 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 character to focus on in the climax. I think they I think uh, Zach did a much better job in the Snyder yeah, cut. He's more important. You, you don't feel like he's just in there to be a comic relief. He kind of has to make the plot function right. And that's a. Uh, I was just gonna say that's something actually I really like about the Snyder cut is that every person in the team feels essential in a, in a different yeah. way. Yeah. As opposed to the Snyder or the um the Whedon version where that wasn't so much the case, but. You say that about Aquaman right. though, because Aquaman, I felt like maybe in this one, I was like, ah, uh, I, I mean, know. he definitely, uh, he he definitely helps take down Steppenwolf. I mean, I can't say specify why without. I guess. Uh, getting I, I mean, he does. Yeah. Oh, to true. me, I to me, I felt like uh, okay. So in in the Avengers, Hulk is kind of that same kind of character, right? I mean, we did get a Hulk movie before, but it wasn't really touched on a lot if at all in the avengers or the mcu moving forward you know that was kind of like okay the incredible hulk happened there you go um and i feel like it's the same thing with aquaman except reverse because we hadn't gotten his movie yet but i don't really think aquaman needed much to 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 do i think that they did a good job explaining why he joined the team uh sort of extending that that original scene with like bruce and him in the I don't even actually know where they are. They're in like a little bar or a pub or something. 
uh, it's right like a by boating the... village where they worship this guy, which yeah. <laughs> funny stuff. Yeah, but I I think that his limited role was was okay because he's a character who even in the comics uh kind of just does better on his own like if you read the aquaman comics he there's a lot more to take from just seeing him in justice league right when he's in justice league he's just there to help the team and i think that really worked in this movie i i wish there was a little bit more uh of of uh jason momoa's like energy in it i i do think that's one of like the negatives for this movie is that in the Whedon version, uh, he did seem a little bit more energetic and like, like just the, the way he was in the Aquaman solo movie. But I don't think that's too big of a of a change. There were enough scenes, especially in the climax, that still made up for that. Um, my my favorite though was was Cyborg. I really liked that uh, we got to see so much development for this character because in the original, he he was he he was the same thing. He wasn't really like he was there, he was for the team, but there was like maybe two or three scenes with him by himself, and you didn't really understand why this character was here or what his purpose was in the uh, in the movie. Yeah, we don't see his backstory. We right. don't see you know. There's barely any characterization with his dad making sense of like why he's in this situation. I mean, they just skipped over all of that. It's awful. Yeah, they they cut a lot out, and it's it's crazy and a little infuriating to see how much was really cut out because. In this version, in Snyder's version, it feels like a much more fully fledged character with like a backstory, a lot of character development, like you said, the history with his dad. Um, and it's honestly, it's something I wasn't expecting to get from Snyder at all, because like you mentioned before, he doesn't really focus too much on the human aspect of these characters, even with a character like Batman, who originally was introduced as sort of that that voice for the people like Superman can't be doing all these things because he's hurting people even in Batman vs Superman uh in my opinion uh and then later on in Justice League and in a uh, Whedon's version he didn't really stick to that you know like he yeah, it got to a point he where frames, he's he frames people as like pesky like why are you complaining Superman's here to protect you you know right. chill out yeah and it's like you at the beginning of this movie at the beginning of Batman vs Superman you were kind of against that ideal and it didn't it it it, it kind of plays into another thing i don't like much about snyder's directing is that he's he introduces a lot of really interesting elements and like he'll put it in the lines or like the dialogue or have these scenes where you know you're supposed to get the idea that uh superman and lois are are like this really great couple but it's like it's a lot of telling and not a lot of showing mm-hmm. i would it's, agree with that yeah it's like uh you're a couple sure you are right but to his credit, I, he did a lot of showing with Cyborg, I think, in this movie. And I kind of wish that he could get the keys to a Cyborg movie if this is the way he's going to do it. Because Cyborg really felt like the most human central character in the movie. He felt like the heart of the team and the reason yeah. that they were... Even though the movie wanted you to believe that it was Superman who was the heart of the team, it felt more like the reason we're all here, the reason we finally got together is because of this character, you know? Yeah, no, I... I definitely agree. That was actually something I was going to say was that I think Cyborg is literally the heart of the film. And the fact that he was taken out of the film to be dramatic or taken out so much of the Whedon version is like the film was literally had his heart ripped out uh, <laughs> as this version came to be. But I think part of that is because I, I do think, I don't know, this is where it feels like the meta text of the film is coming into play where we have to kind of uh, relate to what's going on in real life. Like there is like this very clear and earnest like father son dynamic that you can trace back to you know Snyder's real life where he you know I mean it's it, you don't want to speculate or anything but knowing like what we know now about his personal life th- there is definitely aspects of that story that become a lot more emotional when you watch this version now and when you see what he had with the story and what he had in mind for it and what they took out and what they're able to put back in it just becomes a far more enriching film in a lot of ways because of that it's so cool what they did, you know, to like pay tribute and, you know, dedicating this movie to his daughter, Autumn, and then just pu- putting little things in the movie. Like there's a billboard that, you know, is there as a message to people who might be going through, you know, depression and, and things of that nature. And man, I just thought like that, that to me, I felt more connected to Snyder through that than I have, you know, in, in a lot of other ways, because I just feel like it's, it is honest and it's to the heart. And uh, I'm, I'm glad he was able to do that. And I, I you know, we, we don't have, we don't have to get into it too much, but man, you can just really tell that Whedon just did not do right by Ray Fisher 
we we now know like over the last like year or so like they've really bit we've been they've been coming out with a lot more information about basically how Warner Brothers and Whedon were kind of covering up a lot of abuse on set and I know Adonis this was something that like you you know we were kind of talking about before and it's just uh it's just it's just sad and it's, it, to me it's 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 weird how like Whedon is this guy who's built up so much goodwill with people because of Avengers and his TV work and he's kind of just kind of unraveling a little bit here as like more allegations of just how he's such a toxic person to work with are starting to hit like a, a higher decibel. People are starting to pay more attention to uh, allegations of the, like they just people don't want to work with this guy, but because he's made a lot of great stuff, a lot of good stuff's happened under his watch. He kind of just gets the uh, benefit of the doubt, I guess. But yeah, you can just tell that uh, <laughs> with this movie between the Ray Fisher thing and I, I kind of maintain that I think Aquaman and Superman aren't quite like at a level that work for me still in this. And it, it, Superman didn't work for me in the other one either. It, it felt forced. They were trying to be like, nah, he's, he's the boy scout character. We changed it. Like those movies that you saw where he wasn't, you know, he, he was kind of just this like prick, you know, that stuff wasn't really there. Uh, but and it, uh, you remember like the, the Wheaton version, it opens with like a video of people being like, oh man, Superman, I just want to be, I want to be just like you. And he has like the CGI upper lip or whatever. And that's gone completely. Like all this stuff about Superman being like, he's a symbol. It's like, there's a little bit of that, but it's really more about like, we need this guy because if he's not around, aliens are going to show up and, and wipe us out. So we need to stick up for ourselves. And when it comes to all that lore the, the whole idea of like how America or America, how, how isolationist am I, how the world is sort of protected by like this alliance, the age of heroes stuff with the Amazonians, the Atlanteans, they kind of expand and make this universe feel bigger, right? Where it's like, oh, they mention little things of like, there's no Kryptonian or lanterns like protecting them anymore. And it's like, that's when it feels like an opera. It feels like this movie it's not following the three act structure. It's following the five act structure. It's a play essentially with a big blockbuster budget stuff. And it plays out that way where he is just like dialing up the energy in every scene. The color correction is of course very different. It's, it's a more dour film compared to Whedon's, but Whedon's, it was like color for color's sake. It just, it didn't, it, no, no, nothing about it felt particularly striking like there was no visual excitement really in that movie it was just a lot of like i would say blurry effects and like really like edited down action Flashy. scenes very yeah, flat so, yeah. yeah it's a good way to put it good way, very soda pop whereas this this is like a a, a tall glass of uh whiskey that is probably a uh, corona light but you can't tell but yeah no um the one thing though that I will say I, I I do prefer that the Whedon version does is some of the needle drops, not all of them. I don't know if you two felt that, but I I don't know. I feel like the musical choices in this, I was a little bit like, ah man, should have gotten oh, Edgar Wright to help me out. My God, that. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I I, I definitely agree. Um, the score the is amazing, by the way. Junkie XL, really great, much better than the Danny yeah. Elfman version. Oh, but yeah. The Needle score is different. I would agree with that, yeah. The score in this movie is is really good. I do love Wonder Woman's theme. I think it is the best theme to come out of the DCEU. Just like every time I hear that that um, that cello riff, <laughs> it's just... Yeah. yeah, exactly. It just It just makes the scene so much cooler. And her introduction scene in this film was so much better than the original because it, it had that build up. Um, but there are a lot of song choices in this movie uh, that kind of felt samey and kind of went back to that, that, that thing I don't like about Snyder's movies where it's very, it's very big and he wants you to know that it's very big. Like there's this one song that plays when Aquaman is, and I don't know if oh my gosh. a spoiler because it wasn't in the Whedon one too. There wasn't much change about how he exited. I don't think it's a uh, spoiler just because it's a song. Yeah. <laughs> Where he's like, like, he's, he's It's drinking. a placeholder song. It it's is. like, we need to put a song in here. Pick the first thing that comes up on your iPod. Uh, Jesus is King. Okay. Um, <laughs> but no, it's, it's very, yeah, it's just, it's, it's very, um, 
uh, exactly like very Jesus is kingish, and it's supposed to play into this this idea that like the people there worship Aquaman yeah. as a god and very uh, obvious. Type yeah, it, yeah, it's very on the nose. Thank you, and it, it's cool. And it would have been cool if maybe that was the only one, but there were a couple instances before where they had done songs like that, and there were a couple instances afterwards. I think every time Lois Lane entered the the the, the scene. It was accompanied by like a really on the nose song about how sad she was, and I just I couldn't help but roll my eyes every they time. Well, they might as well have played like "Everybody Hurts" or something. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, definitely weird. The score got much better in the uh, latter half of the cut, I think. Um, especially there's there's like this. I think it's pretty solid the whole way through. It it is pretty solid. I just my favorites were the like the ending scene. Uh, when it gets to that climax and there's that big battle, um, there's like this action uh, oh, yeah. piece that's long, playing throughout the whole action. thing. I, I would say, you know, I already mentioned, I didn't like Man of Steel, but one of the things I did like from Man of Steel was the score, Hans Zimmer's score. Oh, it's a fantastic score. And they, they weave it in. I know that score really well because I've listened to it a lot. It's it's so good. And they weave it in here a lot. Anytime Superman's doing anything, if somebody could be like, well, you remember, I, I don't wear a cape. And then like all of a sudden you'll start hearing the theme, you know, like they just, they, they looked for any excuse. Uh, but and I don't blame them. I don't blame them either. It's a great <laughs> score. It, like that score, especially when they play it in the original trailer for Man of Steel is what got me so hyped about that movie, even though I, I've seen Man of Steel twice, Will, and I fell asleep both times. And I don't know what to tell you. I just. That's, that's your problem. That's a John Negroni problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not mine. <laughs> Uh, I, I want to say a couple of things that didn't work for me with this. So, cause, cause we've been saying nice things about it. Right. And a lot of the nice stuff we, we've really covered. And I think it's pretty easy to say at this point, like you probably know whether or not you're going to watch it or not at this point, but the two big downsides I think are the epilogue. And I, I would just say, I, I do think that this is not a very accessible film. Right. I think you really do have to have you have to be in a certain zone for this sort of thing. And I don't think it's super accessible for people, but it just bugs me to watch a movie that, first of all, feels like a relic of another time. It's like if we were watching Iron Man 2, but Avengers had never happened. And it, there's just an awkwardness there where you're like, you, we, I mean, unless something dramatic happens and i don't think will we're never really going to see the payoff to a lot of what happens toward the end of this movie everything having to do with batman's like premonitions of like what's going to happen with superman and dark side and we know that's not going to pay off there's characters that start showing up tons of cameos that don't make sense and uh, we won't give away the, the one of the big ones that people a lot of people didn't know was going to happen there's like another character that shows up here and they get like two scenes and it's like because we're not going to get another movie most likely it just it just doesn't feel like it should be there and i don't understand why it's there yeah. uh, i guess because they felt like you know that was part of the the original vision right it would be like if like return of the king had like an extra like 15 minutes where they started hyping up like some other like sequel yeah. for lord <laughs> of the rings and it's just like we we just went through this whole like this whole journey why are you What's this stuff? I'm glad you mentioned Lord of the Rings, by the way. Like, unrelated, I think this this movie remind, reminded me a lot of Lord of the Rings. All three of those movies. It, it was like watching one of those movies in terms of its scope and its 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 level of seriousness. I think Snyder was kind of taking a lot from Peter Jackson there. But uh, what were you going to say, Adonis? Um. Well, I agree with that. Uh, I was going to say it. It feels like. I, I understand why the epilogue was kept in there because, like he said, he was, like Zack Snyder said, he was completing his vision, right? So he wanted to show everyone what he had on his laptop when he left uh, Warner Brothers uh, of his own accord all those years ago. And I understand it from that. a big flash that. drive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, isn't the epilogue stuff the stuff they actually reshot in the fall? To be clear, I'm, I'm asking that. Oh, that's true. Know. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. He did reshoot it. Um, but I, I, it, it is new in in the sense that they shot it recently. But I think that he kind of had that plan since the beginning because he, you know, he he referenced all that all that stuff that we see in the epilogue in Batman versus Superman, and it was supposed to connect back to that scene 
uh, where Brisk has his first vision of like the Flash coming back and everything like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, they try to redeem the Jared Leto Joker. Yeah, that is really the only part that definitely does not work for me on any like any much. aspect. Like, like the the scene was cool. I did like the epilogue. Uh, every part of it, from the the secret character cameos to like the the idea that like there could be something bigger on the horizon it's just the idea that it's it's the fact that we probably won't get that and that it was so long like the epilogue itself was like another like 10 15 minutes wasn't it it was it was a lot of extra content that was, was kind of just I think it was another 30 minutes yeah it was it was it was a long time and it was kind of all just tacked on to there at the end and I, I don't know it's it's cool to see it's just like why did it have to to be there i guess if something does come out of it i think that it'll be a little a little more understanding but as it yeah. stands right now it was just kind of a lot at the end there that didn't really need to be put at the end it was like a ferris bueller kind of like oh you guys are still here yeah exactly <laughs> like three and a half hours uh oh well if you guys are still here i got some more stuff i can show you yeah, here exactly right. <laughs> there should there should be an optional like hey like in the uh, during the movie it's like continue watching <laughs> like that right. kind of thing like right after they have their big like team shot and then yeah so what another one last thing i do want to say in terms of like quality and all of that i'm really glad they took out most of the jokes here they took out like the brunch stuff they took out like you know these really hokey ben affleck lines that have just i had I, I was watching the red letter media uh overview of this whole thing and they bring up some of it and show it and I was like, I don't even remember some of those lines, but they're so cringy. And I'm, I'm glad that this got tightened up quite a bit. But let's finish on this. Let's finish on this sort of specula speculatory note or whatever. Speculative, that's the word. Do you, do you think we're going to get something else? Do, do you think, look, anything's possible. We don't have to talk about logistics, but do you really think it can be done that Snyder, Affleck, these people who it seems like they're they're basically done with this. That that's the that's the sense I'm getting, right? But we've gotten that sense before from these people. And we of course there's gonna be another Batman movie, but it's with Robert Pattinson. And it's but it's, that's gonna be in their like more grounded, like of a piece with Joker, that kind of realm of their stuff. They they have built such a flexible, modular franchise where they really can just kind of do whatever. At this a point, multiverse, basically. A multiverse. Yeah. That's it. That's what it is, and so it, it, you know, it, it works for them. They can do. They can do Flashpoint. They can do all of these other things. Do you think that this is going to go anywhere? Do you think that we are going to get a continuation, a real continuation of what we just saw? Uh, we'll, we'll start with you, Will, because I feel like you would probably want that the most out of the three of us, unless I'm mistaken. Uh I mean, I think the reason he included the epilogue or like the scene with the the, the Joker and stuff like that afterwards is because, like what Donis was saying, like I think Snyder knows that he got really lucky and that this is an opportunity that's not going to happen again. And I think he just wanted to include these scenes in there. And he was just like, well, if I have the opportunity, I'm going to do them. I don't really agree with including the Joker either. I don't think that scene worked for me personally, but I felt like he was like, this is my last hurrah. I got to get this stuff out of my system. And I, I think for me, it felt like the last, like th this is like the end for him. But like you said, I don't know because I didn't expect the Snyder Cut to exist, and we have it now. We've watched it, so it's not impossible that it will come to be. I, I think they're sure. already working on a Man of Steel 2 at the moment, and I think they're they're doing another Wonder Woman movie, and they're doing a Flash movie and stuff like that. So I, I think those characters, their stories are going to continue. The big question mark is Ben Affleck. That's, that's yeah, the I think, one. Yeah, I mean, at this point, it does seem unlikely. I know there was going to be the Batman with him at one point where he was going yeah. to direct it as well. I don't think that's on the table anymore, and I would not be surprised if he is done with Batman at this point. I think this is a definitely a better way to end his tenure with the character than the the Whedon version. But I mean, the role the role really did a number on him, like in his personal life. His right. I mean, it, it's if if you're curious about his headspace with all that stuff, watch the way back, and uh, you might get an idea yeah. of where. Yeah, he's you at. can you can follow E News, I guess, if you want to know more about that. <laughs> sure. But, um, <laughs> In any case, uh, I, I do think uh, my guess would be that this is the end for Ben Affleck and 
uh, Zack Snyder's involvement with the DCU. But I will say, never say never. Who knows? They could always recast. You know, somebody else could do it. Uh, Matt Damon. How about him? But uh, okay. Do, but, but Will, but real quick though. Yes or no? Would Would you want, do you actually want this to keep going? Or would you just prefer they kind of move on? I, I'm pretty content with um, this being the end. Like I said, it feels like a pretty satisfying conclusion, at least for me. So I, if this is the end, I'm fine with it. If they want to do more, I don't know, I guess. I mean, I'm not going to say no, but I mean, I don't know. I know he has Army of the Dead coming up on Netflix, I think yeah. next month, or like, I, I think I think that's in May. Um, so I, I'm just curious to see where he's going to go with that. Like, I, I kind of want to see him do stuff outside of the DC universe, because he's been doing it for, I think, 10 years now, basically. So... I mean, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see him branch out, but, you know, like I said, if he does decide to do another DC movie, I'm not going to say no, I'll watch it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, what about you, Adonis, when it comes to the future of the DCEU? Yeah. I mean, do, do you think it could happen and would you, would you be okay with it? Um, the only way I can see it happening is if they go ahead and let him like just have free reign on like HBO Max or something. I don't really see anything coming out of it theatrically uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it kind of seems like... So, I mean, did you guys see the the story that came out uh, just a couple of days ago? Uh, Vanity about, Fair like, piece? The huh? Was it the, are you talking about the Vanity Fair piece? No, not that. Um, but I did read that one. Uh, it, it was basically just him going over what his... Uh, his sequels to justice league would have looked like, uh, like if he could do another justice league and if he could do man of steel two and three, uh, cause he, he, I guess has a full, like a fully fledged plan for all of this. And it seems like a lot. I didn't finish like, uh, it was, it was a video I watched, uh, not a, not something I read, but uh, I didn't finish watching it, but it sounds like he has a lot of ideas that he would like to, that 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 he could fulfill if he got the chance, but at the same time, it kind of sounds like he's also kind of finished. Like this, like Will said, this was his last hurrah, and I think he just wanted to get everything out that he wasn't able to get out back in 2017. And you know, he still has ideas for the future, um, and those ideas would be cool to see. It's just that I don't really think that he could do it with Warner brothers and DC, you know, cause this is a studio that not only has, you know, different tactics on the minds. Uh, there's a lot more people than just Zack Snyder behind the reins. You know, he's not the only director they have yeah. for these movies. Um, so if they could, if they were willing to put money into him again and sort of give him his own streaming Snyder verse, I could see it happening. Uh, but I, I really do think that this is the end for it. Uh, like the epilogue was cool. I just don't think we're going to see much come out of it. I can see maybe DC pulling some ideas from it for future movie ideas. Like Flashpoint can't open the door to like some of the things we saw in this movie getting sort of a a place in their, in their narrative. But I don't think it's going to be 100% Snyder the way that this movie was ever again. Um, and the question of whether I would want to see it. Uh, I I don't know. I, I, like I said, I don't dislike Snyder. There are a lot of issues I have with him as a director. I think he's probably a really nice guy to work with. And I do like how he, he always has the, the energy that you'd want in making a movie. He kind of seems like the guy who comes in and says, okay, well, we why why don't we try this and like he gets people's you know brains working and ideas start bouncing around uh but sometimes it can be like a little much you know like i don't know if i would want to see like two more three or four hour long snyder justice league movies because as happy i am to see his vision out and as much as this movie did get right, like I, I really enjoyed this movie. I think it's really good. I liked it and I would recommend it if you don't mind watching super long movies and you do want to see like a much better version of the Justice League. As much as all of that is true, it's also pretty taxing. And like you said, I don't think it's very accessible for a lot of people, for your average moviegoer. And it just kind of seems like, I, like I, I don't see this particular scenario happening 
two or three more times in the future. So I think this is what we got, and I'm I'm totally satisfied with that. All right. Well, that's about all we got for Zack Snyder's Justice League. Our conversation about it didn't, unfortunately, it did not uh, match the runtime of the movie or even the Whedon version. But that's fine. Uh, I think that's probably for the best. It is an, it is now available to stream on HBO Max, and it is only just 242 minutes long. Uh, if any of you check it out and enjoy it, please let us know. Uh, hopefully, you'll have a good time with it. Thank you so much for listening to our show. Be sure to subscribe to Cinemaholics on your favorite podcast app of choice or find us on YouTube. See you all next time.